Hello and happy World Password Day. I'm Maggie Miller, and on this episode of To The Point, we'll be talking about passwords, something we all have to deal with. Our experts on the show today are Chris Hellenbach. He is the Chief Information Security Officer for the Americas Atanium. So welcome, Chris. Thanks, Maggie. We also have Oliver Kronk. He is the Chief IT Architect for EMEA Atanium. So welcome, Oliver. Hey, Maggie. Nice to be here. I think this will be a fun topic for us today. So let's get started with some stats that I recently came across. It says that more than half of American employees use sticky notes to write down their work-related passwords. Don't worry, this isn't my password, it's my to-do list. But seriously, uh, does this surprise you and how harmful is it really? Doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I actually, um, in, in past jobs, ran investigations where we'd have to go visit an employee desk for an issue, a security incident, and we'd look across to another cubicle and even see stickies posted up. And you could see where they just crossed off one and wrote the next, and you'd even see there where they'd increment a number within their password. So you could just know that, oh, it was 1981 and uh, the name of their sports team. Now it's 1982 in the sports team. You know, so no, doesn't surprise me in the least. Uh, human nature doesn't tend to change that much. What do you think, Oliver? Yeah, no, I, I think um, we have just tried to make password policies ever more rigorous and strict in the perhaps false hope that that is providing a uh, uh, providing security, but it's, it's really an illusion of security when, as you say, Maggie, people are writing them down because they're just too complex to remember. And I think, you know, we can get onto this in a second, but I think there's got to be the right balance of your password policy, um, you know, kind of taking into account what one of your employees, or one of your users is gonna better remember versus what is easy for a hacker to crack. Well, that's a nice uh, lead into all the myths that we hear about passwords. So let's just kind of bust some of these myths up. Um, one that we see a lot is that passwords need to be complex to be secure. What do you think, Chris? Not necessarily so. Uh, you know, Oliver hit, hit it on the head in saying that you could make a long sentence that would be more difficult to guess than just a shorter, more complex thing. And if you um, if you happen to use an iOS device, um, they by default, when you're setting passwords, will suggest a strong password. If you look at it, it's a bunch of random characters, usually just upper and lowercase characters, a dash, maybe a number somewhere in it, but it's long. And that's the main thing. Um, that's That's the greater strength overall. All right, password myth number two, passwords need to be changed frequently. What do you think, Oliver? Uh, I think it depends. Uh, sorry, this is a classic architect's answer, it depends. I, I, I think, you know, your, your password policy needs to be commensurate with the level of risk of the system that it's gaining your access to. Now, clearly, if it's the kind of keys to the castle, like an admin account or something with a massive amount of privilege, then, it, then you probably need to be rotating and changing that password perhaps frequently. But again, if it's got end user account uh, and by changing it like every week or even every month, I would say, are you just forcing your users to do what Chris was saying earlier, like just adding a number that changes at the end or forcing them to write it down? So I think, you know, that's one that need, on balance needs to be really carefully considered, whether that is actually improving security or just being annoying for your users. All right. Myth number three, if I use multi-factor authentication and have a strong password, I'm bulletproof. What do you guys think? No such thing as bulletproof. Um, you know, actually, you know, disruption happens. Um, it, it, you're going to have security incidents no matter what. Uh, there may be other ways that someone gains access to your account. Um, you know, when you authenticate via a website with multi-factor authentication and a strong password, your browser is given a cookie, yeah, whether it be a session cookie or something else, to maintain that session with the website. If your browser or your machine gets compromised, someone can steal that cookie and they can be you. Uh, so there are ways around the password. The, the actor has to do more things to, to get there, but just because you have strong authentication doesn't mean that someone can't gain access to your account. It just makes it a lot harder and that's the goal. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a few things there, I mean, does it make it does it make you bulletproof clearly no as chris says but does it improve convenience of security may, may, maybe i mean like forcing someone to constantly type a password in 
uh, rather than perhaps having a saved password, but then but then requiring MFA, you know, on a phone or something, you know, perhaps is a better experience than forcing a user to kind of put a password in that's quite complex each time. The other thing I would say is all of this sort of uh, plays into sort of you know what the kind of security and IT hygiene of an organisation is, and that that includes you know the kind of multi-factor potentially being part of you know a, a what's known as zero trust, which I know we've spoken about before, Maggie, haven't we? Um, you know, and, and actually, if that is part of a kind of wider security strategy that improves identities and how identities are managed, then sure, that's, again, not bulletproof, but it's an enhancement over just relying on usernames and passwords. So it's certainly, I think, MFA or multi-factor authentication is definitely a good step. It's just like all these security solutions, it shouldn't be treated as a silver bullet because there's no such thing. That's a good point. Uh, fourth and final myth, if my account gets hacked, someone is obviously after me, right? Uh, no, not at all. Um, in most cases, um, intrusions are fairly random on the internet. Um, you, it may be crime of opportunity. You also get what's called credential stuffing. So this is a concept where uh, passwords and email addresses or other pieces of information have been stolen from yet other websites. And because of the difficulty people have in keeping track of all their passwords, you know, this is the base of what we're talking about today, um, they tend to reuse passwords on many sites. So from an intruder perspective, why not just take that known password that they stole from one website and try and use it on a whole bunch of other ones? They're not targeting you per se, it's just they happen to manage to steal some information about you and they're gonna try and reuse it elsewhere. And, and, and on that actually, um, what Chris is saying, there's some really useful tools that most of the major identity providers uh, provide, like you know, the Microsoft ones, the Google ones, and so on, that let you do a bit of a security checkup. And I strongly recommend, as it's World Password Day, perhaps something that everyone can perhaps take five, 10 minutes out of their day to do is run those sites because they're really helpful. A, they give you an idea of if you're using weak passwords. They can also give you an idea of if you're using a repeated password. So are you using the same password on lots of different sites? And they can also, as, as Chris mentioned, tell you about passwords that have been compromised. So that have been in data breaches and can kind of help you, um, you know, identify which ones you perhaps need to change. And this can be daunting because these days, you know, you can have hundreds, if not thousands of usernames and passwords right online for different online services. And a bit of advice I would give people is think about the accounts that you care the most about. And for me, that is often, you know, the kind of major accounts that are either banking or have my payment, payment information or perhaps have access to other accounts. So things like the, my Google account, my Microsoft account, you know, my main sort of tech accounts, they're almost like, I would call like a tier one for me personally. I need to make sure those are secure, they have MFA enabled, they're using a unique password that, that's strong. The other ones that perhaps are just for a news website that are kind of, you know, doing a, a subscription, it's more of a convenience that I have a user profile there. Sure, you, you still don't want those to be compromised, but is that as important as your online, online banking? Probably not. So don't be overwhelmed by like seeing this whole list of, uh, you know, orange and red that you, these tools will show go through them and go, right, I'm, I, I care about that one because that's banking. I care about that one because it's online shopping with my payment card. I don't care so much about Forbes or whatever, whatever some of the other ones are on the list. Yeah, Oliver, you just mentioned something important about that, which is you know securing those key email accounts because a lot of the websites that you're going to access, they'll send uh, password reset emails to mm -hmm. that address, things of that sort. So a key link in the chain of making sure someone can't uh, overtake your account, is making sure the email account that, that's gonna be the recept reception point for all of this is secured. If not, uh, it becomes trivial for someone to take over our accounts. You, you, you see me smiling here because I recently had to help a family member who managed to get themselves locked out of a whole bunch of accounts because someone you know, got in through a weak password and. It then it then took me a few hours to kind of you know get get their access back again and it was it was quite challenging so no I, I reiterate that the importance of yeah certainly if you're using webmail that needs to be you know that that is like a, I would say a tier one it's your crown jewels really some of those accounts that as you say Chris if they get compromised it's just a massive headache uh you know to sort that out well, what are some of the best practices organi organizations can take when it comes to implementing password policies? 
Um, you know, Oliver mentioned some of it, which is, you know, decide on what accounts need that, that greater tier of protection. Um, the idea behind changing passwords as a whole is the notion that eventually they're going to be discovered. They're eventually going to be compromised. So what is that useful lifetime of a password before you know, an adversary gets a hold of it and something happens. So as he mentioned, administrative accounts probably should be changed more frequently than a, a general user account, but also two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication should be on for everyone mm. in any organization period, um, but especially for, for your administrative accounts. Don't change it too frequently, um, and you know because there is that balancing act. And go for length rather than anything else. Um, the, the the number of studies that have gone around on this, you know, a, a full phrase is far better than a um, random ten to twelve character password. Oliver, any other uh, best practices or tips? I think some of the attacks that we've seen, the public quite public attacks we've seen, have come about as a result of passwords being stored in places like GitHub and you know places where code should be, but credentials, credentials almost certainly should not. So I think one of the other tips would be perhaps as well as your policy, you know, reviewing policy, it's perhaps you know, just checking where have passwords ended up kind of making, making their way into different places. Where have, those, where have those landed? Where have they ended up? So you know, perhaps we'll touch a bit more on that in a moment, but I think it's, as much, it's one thing to sort of set a policy. It's another thing to sort of check what is actually happening in the field, you know, in the in the world? What are your users doing, and what are your systems administrators and, and developers doing with passwords? Because it's one thing to say, right, we've got ultra secure password policies, but if those are effectively being circumvented by them being copied and pasted all over the place, then you're going to be a world in a world of pain. And how can Tatum help organizations with password policies and protection? Well, there's a couple different ways. One, we can uh, ensure that the global policies are actually being applied to endpoints so that the endpoints are uh, actually enforcing those policies. But importantly, as more and more passwords show up in organizations because of the number of systems that are involved, people are going to write them down. Now, whether they write them out on a sticky or they make use of a notepad file on their desktop, uh, which happens amazing amounts. You can actually see people have things like passwords.txt on their desktop. We, uh, we laugh, but it, but it, but it happens. It happens a lot. Because it's pretty serious. Yeah. Um, but also they make use of third-party tools, um, password archive tools, um, LastPass, and a number of others out there to, to record passwords. Um, but they might not be setting a good master password to encrypt all of those other ones. Uh, recently, not all, not all that long ago, a, um, a network um, hardware company um, got hacked and part of the hack was that they got into an employee's uh, password manager. And inside that password manager were a number of administrative credentials clearly not all two-factor authentication. Uh, and they made use of that information to then go laterally through the environment and compromise more things. Uh, in fact, I think part of it was also getting um, cloud credentials to, to get into some cloud resources. Uh, so those types of things, you have to know they exist in your environment. So looking for the application being installed, looking for the presence of the file types, you know, those last few characters of the file name um, to, to see if they exist on disk, because then you can at least start to manage that risk and then look to whether or not you need to implement a, a centralized password vault of some sort rather than individual ones on desktops. Yeah. And, and I'd add to the wider story, you know, with, with my sort of architect hat on, how Tanium can be part of that zero trust ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, clearly Google were, were instrumental behind things like Beyond Corp and, and they kind of, you know, one of the founders of the zero trust kind of idea and concept and, and, and sort of um, practice. Uh, and, and Tanium is a very proud member of that, of that Beyond Corp ecosystem. Uh, but, but equally, we can be used you know, to, to verify the, the device, the endpoint itself, the, the integrity of that endpoint, because you can have great identity management and you can have great other bits of your security, but if your endpoint is fundamentally, you know, suffering from compromise or issues, 
then that can just completely undermine the other pieces of your security. You know, as, as a lot of people say, it's a, it's a layered approach security. And if we can, you know, ensure that that endpoint layer is sound, that then, you know, it, it gives a good foundation for the zero trust kind of architecture to sort of sit on top of. So, you know, Tanium very much is a, is a um, team player in, in this regard. You know, we work with the likes of Google and, and, other, uh, and others to provide that kind of capability. Uh, and as Chris says, you know, being able to see what you've got in the estate is foundational. You know, that, that kind of IT hygiene and security hygiene 101 is knowing what you've got and then seeing what's on it. And as Chris says, if we can see where there are password files stored in plain text across the uh, across the environments, you know, that that is a, is a big win for a lot of our customers. Um, you know, I know some some of our recent customers, it's been one of the use cases that's been really compelling for them to take on Tanium because no one else has the capability to go and find files across the environment like we can. So, you know, when it comes to stored passwords, that's that's kind of a big concern for large organizations and small organizations. So, yeah, there are a number of ways we can help. I'm conscious we haven't got, you know, all day to talk about this because I know I could talk about it for a long time. But I guess in, in short, you know, Tanium is a, is a key component of that jigsaw when it comes to security. And thank you both for your time and insights today. Hopefully everyone will leave this video and go change those passwords or at least uh, shred those sticky notes, right? <laughs> well, and maybe not even change them, but make sure that they're, they're following those practices. And then if they're yeah. not, then change them. All right. Even better advice. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for watching. I'm Maggie Miller, and this is To The Point.